making some, some yummy snacks to help propel us along during the day. So please do help yourselves. Uh, make sure you have coffee, food, tea, what have you. Um, I'm going to turn things over now to my colleague, Charlotte Howell, um, and she'll be the chair for our next session. Great. First up, we have Dr. Elena Levine, the professor in de the Department of Journalism, Advertising, and Media Studies at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. Um, she is prolific in writing about kind of television studies and all sorts, but some of her excellent books include um, with Michael Z. Newman, Legitimating Television, Media Convergence and Cultural Status, and upcoming Her Stories, Daytime t Soap Opera and U.S. Television History. And so she'll be talking about streaming soap operas. Thank you, Professor Levine. Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here today and to share some recent work with you. Um, when we talk about streaming television these days, we tend to think about checking out the newest Amazon pilot entries or binging multiple seasons of Friends on Netflix or picking up an HBO Go subscription to watch the latest season of Girls. But the world of streaming TV is much broader than that might suggest. Um, and it includes a number of continuing scripted fictional programs that get labeled in a range of ways. Sometimes they get called web soaps or digital daytime drama series or indie series or indie soaps. And I assume few of you have seen these programs or have much experience with them. So I wanted to start today by just giving you a brief example from one of them. Um, this is the opening scene from a series called Venice. Um, and it debuted in late 2009 and, and continues to today. So let me show you um, an opening scene from that show. I want you to taste me when you breathe, to smell my scent on your sheets. I want you to miss me the way that I am missing you. Good morning. Morning. <laughs> that was mm. amazing. Yeah. Really amazing. It's been a long time since we've been together. I'm surprised to run into you last night. Well, I, I've been back um, from New York just a few days. I, I, I wasn't sure if I should call you, given the way we left things. Fine. I love, love, love being with you. That was never in question. So, what exactly was last night? Fun. Oh, fun? Fun. fun. What does that mean? Mm, exciting, pleasurable. Oh I'd like God. to do it again. I, you're such a smart ass, mm. I forgot. Now, Venice um, is uh, one of a number of the kinds of programs um, I'm talking about today. It's produced by a company called Open Book Productions. Um, and Open Book has released an um, extended pilot for another program called The Grove and has been involved in web series such as um, one set in Boston called Beacon Hill. And um, Open Book was founded by um, one of the actresses you just saw, Crystal Chappelle. And she's an actress who's worked primarily in the daytime television soap operas of U.S. broadcast television. So she, in uh, the 80s and early 90s, was on um, Days of Our Lives, and I believe she's back on Days of Our Lives now. Um, and she was also very well known for her role on Guiding Light. Um, this is a surprisingly common resume for a number of the creators, producers, and performers in the kinds of series I'm talking about. Um, among them, programs like Gotham, The Bay, Tainted Dreams, Winter Thorn, and Ladies of the Lake. These all have roots in the conventional daytime television soap opera. So series, uh, considering what unites them and why they have come to exist. I'm pairing my discussion of this case with another more corporate and Hollywood affiliated example of the place of soap opera in the short history of streaming television. Um, and I'm going to look at these two cases to help us understand how streaming television is developing as an industry um, and also somewhat as a cultural practice and how these developments can offer us insight in particular into the persistence of certain kinds of cultural hierarchies amidst the growth of new media. 
So by focusing on these connections between digital series and a, one of broadcasting tele, one broadcast television's oldest and most historically profitable and popular genres, the daytime soap opera, I'm arguing for the ongoing significance of soap opera to our television culture, uh, despite the declines that this genre has experienced in the world of conventional broadcasting. The web series fringe, pretty marginalized existence online mirrors the historic position of daytime broadcasting as a culturally denigrated sphere that nonetheless has been recognized as speaking to subordinated interests, those of women in particular. So we tend to associate technological change with cutting edge, high profile instances. But across media history, there's examples of experimentation with new technologies that fly under the radar, that sometimes because of their low cultural status or their association with marginalized identities, they don't get as much attention in our critical histories and just in our culture more generally. So today I'm gonna focus on this idea of web soap opera in the short history of original scripted streaming, telev streaming television in order to understand that as an aspect of our changing media environment in a way that might not always get our attention um, and that I think is revealing of some broader forces at work. So in particular, I'm looking at the way these um, programs might tell us something about questions around cultural distinction. So let me explain a little bit what I mean by that. So in my work with Michael Newman on changing conceptions of television in the 21st century convergence era, we examine the ways that US television has improved its cultural status over this period, has gotten more culturally legitimated and respected. A medium that was once widely dismissed as the boob tube or a vast wasteland is now more commonly referred to as being in a golden age of peak TV with programming that is cinematic and novelistic, accruing to the medium a respectability that's typically associated with more venerated forms of cultural expression, cinema, novels, etc. So in le legitimating television, we analyze the various paths through which television has been accorded this improved cultural status and the ways that today's highly respected forms of TV are often juxtaposed with television that's associated with the past or with audiences that have less social and economic power. So uh, just to give you a little more background, for example, we consider the ways that a promotional slogan such as the HBO, it's not TV, it's HBO slogan, works to set the premium cable channel apart from ordi so-called ordinary TV. Um, as if the channel's programming escaped all of our negative cultural associations with the medium by virtue of charging a subscription fee rather than being advertiser funded. Now, as we as well, um, in our project, we note the ways that many of the most highly valued series of this recent era, including HBO's, have been serialized dramas. Um, critics, creators, everyday audiences, of these serialized programs themselves have gone to great lengths to distinguish themselves from their most obvious influence and predecessor, the soap opera. And we see this distinction as being a highly gendered one and also a classed one, giving longstanding assumptions about soap opera audiences as female and often as eco economically disempowered. So highly praised series, think something like The Sopranos, um, have gained much of their cultural stature by being presented and received as these wholly original efforts to tell continuing stories that depict char character interiority and character change over time. Um, now, admitting the similarities between those kinds of textual features and those of a less respected form like daytime soap opera would diminish the value of those lauded series. Um, thus, any connection between these genres is often kind of denied or ignored or refused. Now, there's a third realm um, within which we see these distinctions happening, um, and that's um, technological development where old fashioned, so-called old fashioned ways of watching TV over the air, real time with commercials, get disparaged in a lot of our contemporary discourse as the practices of viewers who don't know any better, um, who are either maybe too poor or too uneducated or too old or too unsophisticated or too technologically illiterate to, to keep up supposedly with the changing technology. So Legitimating Television was published in 2012. So we really only touched briefly on streaming TV. Um, the rise of streaming over the past five years offers a logical extension of our ideas. And so I'm gonna sort of try and pull these ideas forward into the streaming era. So um, especially since the launch of its first original series in 2013, Netflix has promoted its streaming video service as the future of television. This was from a talk by a Netflix executive. 
And uh, media scholar Chuck Tryon argues that this exaggerates the transformative potential of technological change that a service such as Netflix delivers. Um, and it does so in order to increase the value of a subscription in the minds of consumers. People have to feel like they're getting something new and forward thinking to subscribe to Netflix. And that's very much the strategy that HBO used beginning in the late 1990s to justify its value to its subscribers. Now, while the marketing strategies of services such as Netflix adapt the discourses of legitimation that we talk about in legitimating television to the newer world of streaming TV, um, particularly streaming TV originals, they also reproduce some of the same exclusions and hierarchies we identified as circulating earlier in the 21st century. In situating the experience and technologies of streaming as well as the highly regarded original content of services like ne Netflix as better television, Streaming technologies, producers, audiences, and content are set apart from this mythological past other TV associated with older technologies, older viewers, and their supposedly inferior habits and tastes. Yet the characterization of streaming TV through this kind of Netflix-specific lens excludes much of the wider array of streaming production and distribution practices that predate and exist alongside those of these major players, like a Netflix. Um, not to mention just um, kind of discounting the ways that you know many hours of traditional television fill Netflix viewing um, schedules. A lot of what people watch on Netflix are old um, broadcast series. So scholars are just beginning to elaborate on the history of streaming TV. So we're still uncovering ways that players other than major corporate driven portals like Netflix have been shaping this new landscape. Um, Work such as that by um, Amar Jean Christian on uh, grassroots efforts like Open TV, um, which is a platform that supports and distributes independent streaming television created by marginalized groups, um, as well as some of the examples I'm discussing today, which are not explicitly open TV projects but are, can be associated with them in various respects, can really help us understand streaming television as something that's quite diverse and varied and also connected to legacy television and its viewers um, in ways that the discourses of legitimation around Netflix and other um, uh, mainstream corporate dominated streaming TV portals might not otherwise allow us to see. So to help us grapple with these more marginalized practices of streaming TV and their role in the changes that we're seeing, um, my first case today is an effort of the early 2010s to produce streaming continuations of two long-running daytime TV soap operas. So this was an effort that was ultimately rather short-lived, um, but it's revealing, I argue, of early attempts at Hollywood-generated original streaming content and the ways that these efforts perpetuated some of these long-standing cultural hierarchies I've been talking about. So to understand my examples, I want to just give you a, a hopefully quick background about the state of daytime television soap opera leading up to this point. So this is a genre that got its start in the days of broadcast network radio in the 1930s, um, when creators developed daily, then 15-minute continuing fictional stories as a framework through which to advertise domestic goods to housewives. Um, many uh, uh, manufacturers of laundry and dish soaps were um, typical sponsors of these programs. And that fact, paired with the sometimes melodramatic content of the, pro of the shows, um, earned the programs this disparaging label of soap opera. And since then, it's kind of been more widely accepted, which is why I use the term today, um, not in a disparaging way. Now, with the advent of television in the 1940s and 50s in the US, the genre gradually transitioned into the new medium. And from there, the programs became increasingly profitable and popular. Um, their relatively low production cost helped to generate large profit margins from advertising revenue. And the episodes expanded first to 30 minutes and then to hour-long lengths um, across TV history. The income that the broadcast networks um, accrued from daytime pretty much underwrote the primetime schedule um, across the classic network era of the 1960s and 70s um, and the early 80s. Um, and that's also the time in which so daytime soap opera was gradually was, you know, expanding its audience, really moving beyond sort of the stereotypical housewife audience to include um, young people, college students in particular became very um, avid viewers of these shows, um, men became um, much more invested in these shows, and the, sh the genre really became something of a pop cultural sensation by the early 80s. Well, that would prove to be the genre's peak. Um, ad revenues and ratings began a slow, continual decline in the subsequent decades. 
Um, this, of course, coincides with the era that's sometimes called the post-network era of television, when those original big three networks, NBC, CBS, and ABC, started to face real competition for the first time in their history, first from new broadcast networks, then from cable, and then eventually, of course, from the internet. And daytime soap opera has faced the same challenges that all of broadcast network television has in this environment, um, but such factors as growing numbers of women in the workplace and the poor efforts to um, by the Nielsen Company to, to measure kinds of viewing that are not live um, it, home viewing uh, also contributed to some of the issues that the genre has had in the industry. So what happened was that in 2009, um, two of the genre's longest running programs, Guiding Light and As the World Turns, were canceled. Um, and this really signaled a, a pretty dramatic contraction in the industry. Um, in 2011, ABC canceled two of its three continuing soap operas, All My Children and One Life to Live. And it really became clear that the 2010s were going to be unlike any earlier period in broadcasting history for the world of daytime television and for daytime television soap opera in particular as the number of programs drastically reduced. But ABC's cancellations of these two programs initiated a new development uh, in this continuing story. Soon after the cancellation announcement, a production company named Prospect Park made a deal to license these canceled daytime soap operas from their owner, who was Disney, which had pur purchased ABC in the 90s, um, and planned to continue new episodes of these uh, daily soaps as the launch content for a digital platform that Prospect Park was creating um, called the Online Network. Now, this was a quite early move um, in the world of long-form scripted series produ produced for a, a first online run. Um, so considering this Prospect Park project amidst broader developments in the history of online video really, I think, helps us to see um, how significant the soap opera genre has been in these histories of media change. It was sort of there at the beginning of playing with this idea of original online content. So um, this has been the case for soaps throughout their history. Let me give you just a quick example of this. Um, soap opera was a participant in um, digital content quite early. Um, Sony owned a web portal called SoapCity.com, and in 2003, they offered downloadable episodes of some daytime soap operas. And it was really the first time anyone had made a current series from a major network available um, online, you know, legally, um, in this case through download, pre-streaming, pre obviously in 2003. Just as a comparison, iTunes didn't start offering downloadable television episodes until 2005. So this, you know, separate website was doing this for soap opera episodes before iTunes even existed. I mean, it existed but didn't exist for TV. Across the history of daytime drama, then, um, the genre's innovations and content, um, as well as technological developments, have often served as launch points for these kind of more high-profile, more prestigious endeavors. So Prospect Park initially planned to produce daily long-form episodes, 60-minute episodes, just like had aired on broadcast TV five days a week, um, a format that was totally untried on the web at the initiation of this project in July 2011. So, you know, it's hard to talk about 2011 as the long ago past, but when it comes to the development of these things, it, it, it is. Um, and just to put that in perspective for you, it was later in 2011 that Hulu Hulu debuted the first of the commercial services um, long-form original series. It was a, docu a Morgan Spurlock documentary series. Um, and in March 2011, um, Netflix had a kind of bidding war with HBO and licensed House of Cards um, from them with plans to make the political drama its first original series. So they bought House of Cards in 2011. It's not going to appear for a couple more years. So this idea of offering long-form, continuing scripted series originally produced for the web was in the air, but no one had really done it yet when Prospect Park licensed these programs from Disney ABC in 2011. So this very early and, you know, and kind of ridiculously, it would turn out, ambitious effort, um, the Prospect Park project quickly encountered obstacles mostly in terms of labor issues and budget issues. Um, the company began talking to the relevant labor guilds about estimating the startup and continuing production costs for this kind of endeavor. There were no more sets left. Um, ABC had disposed of all the sets and the wardrobe. Everything was gone from these show's productions when Prospect Park decided to move forward. So they had to kind of start everything from scratch. 
So in 2011, Prospect Park said, well, you know, there's too many problems. The project isn't going to go forward after all. And then a few months later, they returned to it again. Um, but they kind of scaled down their ambitions. They said, okay, we're going to do 30-minute episodes, not 60-minute episodes. We're going to do um, – they gradually kept going down to two episodes a week instead of five episodes a week. Um, and so they kind of scaled back their ambitions. They also instituted various cost-saving measures. Um, for example, they decided they were going to pay actors weekly instead of the uh, a system that has been used in daytime soap opera since the 50s, which is guaranteeing actors a certain number of episodes um, per week and paying them for that guarantee regardless of what they actually work. Um, and they decided to produce both soaps in Connecticut because of tax breaks in that state. They had challenges by the major labor, um, the major technical union for um, TV um, labor. And we, as a result of that controversy, we found out that Prospect Park agreed a few extra day crew members on their union rate, as long as their individual episode budgets remained extremely low. Um, so there's all these, you know, kind of economic factors that are shaping what is going to be possible here. So there's some talent, on-screen and off-screen talent, from the broadcast series who get associated with these online um, projects. Um, they were very constrained by these restrictive budgets and arrangements. So what happened is that the two soap operas each released an initial season of 40 episodes in 2013. Um, All My Children, I'm going to show you just a brief example of. All My Children fast-forwarded five years from where the daytime series ended and cast um, some new young actors alongside some of the broadcast veteran actors in the program and really try to emphasize this combination of the familiar and the innovative in the new venture. So let me show you a quick clip from the first episode of um, the All My Children Online version. Oh. oh, Palmer. Our baby boy is coming home today. <laughs> you can see the ways they're really kind of ironically commenting on what they're doing here. So after these initial runs of 40 episodes, the project was again discontinued. Um, the challenges of profit in the online realm proved really precarious, and Prospect Park had really underestimated the labor and the cost of this kind of serialized television production, um, which is pretty much in keeping with the um, underappreciated, under-the-radar work that has sustained the, the industry of daytime television across its history. Now, Prospect Park's project is revealing of the early challenges in producing these long-form original streaming series, um, but the challenges of the online soap's distribution are also revealing of a lot of these hierarchies that shape um, our streaming TV business. So in the late 2000s, streaming video outlets owned by major commercial Hollywood players like Hulu and Netflix were not offering original content. Um, instead, they were focused on secondary distribution of content produced for conventional film and TV. Um, it wasn't until 2011 that more and more of these Hollywood-associated entities began to explore original web fare. Um, first, YouTube announced that it was going to launch um, 100 online TV channels, they called them, in partnership with Hollywood providers. And Prospect Park um, was a producer of conventional content like the USA series Royal Pains, and they, um, they were the, exactly this kind of Hollywood provider that, um, would, uh, that YouTube was talking about starting to partner with in 2011. Um, Prospect Park's programming would appear on Hulu, not on YouTube. 
Now, Hulu's status, I think, is really crucial to understanding what happened to the Prospect Park project, as well as the ways that cultural hierarchy, I think, has shaped streaming television more generally. Um, Hulu began to program original series um, from various genres alongside these soap projects. But its early involvement in long-form, first-run, scripted streaming television got really um, uh, overshadowed by Netflix, which was debuting House of Cards around the same time that Prospect Park was debuting these soaps on Hulu. Um, and Netflix quickly started other original series right after that. Now, Amazon Video, the other main competitor for these portals, um, also began to do debut original series in spring of 2013. So that spring 2013 is really the key time for original online streaming kinds of things. Now, portals such as Netflix and Amazon differentiated themselves from Hulu, and, and from YouTube for that matter, by eschewing commercial advertising, um, funded instead by subscription or pay per stream models. Um, the economic base of those portals, paired with efforts by Netflix in particular to become known as the more prestigious and superior form of entertainment, um, I think really helped to make what was going on on Hulu seem much less significant and lower profile. Um, of course, Hulu was owned by a partnership of broadcast networks um, and originally included unskippable, unskippable commercials. I don't know if people remember that, but um, linking it all the more to that broadcast model despite its, its streaming delivery, it seemed much more like conventional TV. By 2016, of course, Hulu transitioned away from that subscription um, and toward a subscription-only service. Um, in keeping with its competitors' efforts. So that kind of more similar to broadcast model disappeared. Seen in this broader context, I think it's not surprising that their positioning on Hulu, combined with the financial challenges I've been talking about, really disadvantaged the streaming versions of the canceled broadcast soaps from the outset. Um, a genre historically intertwined with commercial sponsorship, daytime scheduling, domestic viewing, and a feminized audience, is by definition that which the prestige-hungry streaming TV culture um, has distinguished itself from, and it was really kind of disadvantaged as a result. Um, now, this more corporate-driven effort at streaming soap opera um, was really um, outpaced by the promotional maneuverings and production budgets of portals such as Netflix and Amazon. But there was a separate economy of more independent web series production and distribution going on at the same time. Um, and that's my second example, um, and that includes shows like Venice, the series, the example with which I began today. So the place of soap opera in the world of independent streaming television has been the more successful of these experiments with streaming um, for soap opera and demonstrates another important strand, I think, in the history of streaming television. Um, Prospect Park didn't kind of come up with this idea of putting soaps on streaming in a vacuum. Um, it was really in keeping with a much longer history of audiovisual content online that has been repeatedly imagined as being soap opera or like soap opera in some way. So before broadband, broadband technology made video streaming viable, there were a number of text-based programs, sort of programs that were called cyber soaps, um, modeled after a big hit in 1996 called The Spot, um, which was a serialized narrative produced by an ad agency um, to experiment with web-based storytelling and audience engagement. Um, so it was all text-based. I think there might have been some images as well. Um, so Christian has studied the spot a bit, and he argues that the spot and other of these cyber soaps were a way of imagining web-based media as a form of television, even though they didn't include sound and video, the things that we associate with TV. Um, gradually, the development of webcams and broadband led to more video-based series, sometimes called vlogs or video blogs at first, some scripted, some unscripted. So um, in 2006, the sensation Lonely Girl 15 um, was, a, I think, the, one of the first high-profile examples of this playing with this new form, um, scripted, turns out fictional, serialized narrative that appeared to be an average teen girl's webcam musings from her bedroom. So these kinds of productions grew in sophistication across the 2000s. Um, YouTube's launched in late 2005, and it made the circulation of these kinds of more conventional television-like um, projects possible. Now, Christian describes the mid-2000s craze for streaming video as a period in which a number of players were trying to kind of deal with this crazy new thing called the web and present stre streaming content in ways that was more like television. Um, and 
often this meant taking independently produced and user-generated content and finding ways to make it friendly to advertisers, because of course that's how television had long run. So a lot of these were reality programs, sketch comedy programs, but there were others that were scripted continuing narratives, often caught called web soaps, um, very much referencing that television genre. And these independent efforts, I think, um, you know, foreshadowed what, I th what we've come to see as streaming TV series today. So the intersections of the web soap world and conventional broadcast soap opera were really made explicit in 2008 when the Writers Guild of America went on strike. Um, and of course, digital content residuals were a really important issue in the Writers Guild strike of that period. Um, and this led some of the writing talent from daytime TV to generate some of these independent web-based productions. Um, so WGA members launched an online platform called Strike TV at this period as a way to distribute their independently produced content. Um, it was really a way to say, you know, screw you Hollywood, we can do this on our own, we don't need you. Um, and one of the pilots that Strike TV offered was um, a soap opera called Life in General. Um, and it was a comedic take uh, um, on a behi behind the scenes drama at um, a fictional daytime soap opera. It was created by um, a writer of a daytime soap opera, General Hospital, her name was Karen Harris, and starred a number of soap affiliated actors. So let me show you a quick clip from um, Life in General. Story wise as well, because then you get Raymond, the control. Raymond, Winnie, Raymond. the barn cannot explode. It can't. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Winnie, I, I want you to meet Julian. Who? Hi. Uh, Raymond, w we need to talk. It's important. Oh, all right, Winnie, just settle down. Now, come on here. Uh, just, should I leave? No, I want you to find out how things work around here. Now, what is it, dear? What, uh, what can I do for you? Raymond, you can't keep rewriting me. We, we had a deal. No. Pinks. I didn't rewrite. Oh, thank you, dear. Uh, oh, but this, oh, this is a great scene. It came to me in a dream. It undermines my authority. I, uh, what is he still doing here? We see Julian wrote a beautiful graduate thesis. Oh. And soap opera, what, what, was, what was the name of it? Uh, Dickens the Daytime, America's contribution to the canon of serialized literature. Mm -hmm. Tell her how you describe me, huh? No. No, come on. <laughs> well, he, he's the godfather of American soaps, a legend in his own time, the creative genius behind the second longest running daytime drama, Greenville General. I thought that was quite funny, the guy with his graduate thesis. Um, so um, the project um, inc even included an episode of the fictional soap within the soap, Greenville General. Um, but Strike TV really faltered because it didn't have a good funding strategy. Harris's project you know, had really kind of literalized, I think, the long-standing connection between soap opera proper and scripted web-based series, but it had a relatively short um, chance at existence. Life in general, as well as other 2008 web series with soap connections, there was one called Imaginary Bitches that had one of the, was connected to conventional soap opera, offered this kind of ironic, comedic take on soap opera that suggested that the web soap might offer a fresh perspective on this long-running genre. Now, other independent web-based projects begun in the late 2000s also borrowed from soap opera, sometimes in this kind of ironic, comedic way, but also with more straightforward adaptations of daytime drama. Um, and many of these featured um, perspectives and personnel that have been afforded little attention across the history of broadcast daytime. So one example of this is Anthony Anderson's um, series Anacostia. Um, this is not the Anthony Anderson from Blackish. It's a different Anthony Anderson. Um, began in 2009 as a web series inspired by the daytime and primetime soaps that the creator had long loved. Um, but Anacostia was quite different. It was set in an African-American neighborhood of Washington, D.C. It featured a black cast and dramatized uh, stories of a, an array of black characters. Um, Venice, of course, placed a lesbian love story at its center, which was also quite um, a diversification from what was typical of broadcast daytime. They really foregrounded experiences and characters that have received very little attention in broadcast soap opera. Now with the cancellation of so many network soaps between 2009 and 2011, the web soap world became even more connected to conventional daytime. Um, and a number of experienced daytime actresses in particular have been really active participants in this web series world. Um, They've be found their opportunities for creative autonomy and authority that were not available to them in network daytime. Um, and this allowed them to represent themes and, and ideas that had give, been given very little attention in the more conservative world of, of network TV. 
So Venice makes that clear. Let me just explain the brief connection here. So on Guiding Light, Crystal Chappelle's character, Olivia, had begun to have a same-sex relationship with um, Jessica Leach's character, Natalia, in the soap's final year on air. But the program was canceled, and their relationship was sort of cut short and never really got to develop. Venice was deliberately designed to satisfy the fans of this couple um, from Guiding Light. So Chappelle cast herself and Leachia as the web soap's central pair, Gina and Annie. And as you saw, the program was launched with a scene of the two of them in bed, um, which never happened on Guiding Light. Um, and it was something that the fans had really been, been waiting for. You know, this case is not unique. Um, other daytime talents, such as um, Martha Byrne from As the World Turns, be have become writers, directors, and producers of web soaps. Um, Byrne joined Anacostia in 2011 and was part now part of the creative team as well as in the cast. Um, and typically if these shows can have some daytime soap talent, they have almost a full cast of daytime soap talent. Um, and I think a big pleasure in these shows for fans is seeing their favorite actors from an array of different soaps brought together in these new contexts. Um, so even when people who aren't necessarily affiliated with soap, daytime soaps um, have started these web series, they've often brought in daytime talent. So an actress like Mary Beth Evans, who's best known for her role on Days of Our Lives, um, is in a, a web series called The Bay, um, which has also brought on board um, a former executive producer of General Hospital named Wendy Rich. And these connections between conventional daytime and web soaps are, are really quite strong. So with less work available in the shrunken industry of broadcast soaps, many of the players associated with the genre have become quite active in this indie soap world. Um, they've been motivated by the creative opportunities on offer. Um, they haven't been making a lot of money so far. But there are recent signs that the industry is mainstreaming and beginning to turn a profit. Um, a scholar, Amanda Lotz, has argued that the first-run transaction sale model of internet distributed series has been limited to just one um, Louis C.K. program in 2016. But actually, some web soaps, like Venice, have been supported through this sort of direct sale to consumers at one time or another. They've, they've monetized these things in lots of different ways, but some of them have been asking people to actually pay for the series. Um, and Guiding Light fans who followed her to Venice, Chappelle to Venice, were, were quite willing to pay for it. There's signs that these independently produced web soaps, soaps are beginning to kind of move towards the Hollywood model of distribution um, as more independent portals are acquired by big conglomerates. And some digital series have been repackaged to run on some of the major streaming sites. So some quick examples. Netflix has begun to distribute a uh, secondary distribution of a number of Latin American telenovelas um, beginning in 2015. So this is a, you know, a separate industry from the one I've been talking about, but I think it's quite interesting as um, you know, a potential direction that Netflix certainly isn't going to be its main um, high-profile direction, but there's a lot of these programs there. More recently, The Bay um, that I mentioned and also this soap, Tainted Dreams, um, have gotten distribution deals with Amazon. And they'd aired, you know, these are secondary distribution, they'd aired on other sites previously, um, but have sh been shifting here. And this May, I think we're going to be seeing what is the first of these series to be released first run on Amazon um, with the launch of this program, Ladies of the Lake. Um, and it will be interesting to see, like, if more of these shows will debut on a mainstream portal like this. Um, probably depends on how well, it that, how well this one does. So this mainstreaming of web soaps is quite a new development, one that suggests a potential economic viability to the programs that might make them more broadly influential in the years to come. They're really born of efforts by conventional soap personnel and longtime viewers to create an independent alternative. Um, and I think the world of streaming soap opera shows us the way that streaming television is a wider and more diverse world than a focus on high profile efforts like those of Netflix um, or Amazon might allow. Attending to these streaming TV histories that float along these margins um, I argue really helps us to imagine and advocate for a media environment that permits more voices, more perspectives, more representations, not to mention more opportunities for creative labor um, than the corporate dominated efforts alone allow. Um, if you're familiar with the culturally denigrated but long standing and robust history of the daytime TV soap opera, you can really see that the role of the genre in the short history of streaming TV is really not that surprising. Um, it, it validates the genre's history as a, uh, a pioneer in embracing new media, in tackling controversial content, speaking to marginalized interests, offering creative opportunities to women in particular, um, all while being sort of ignored or disparaged by others in um, the industry and the culture. 
So I hope my talk today has helped you think about how these new media platforms and portals are shaped by lots of ver cultural forces and economic forces um, that are often hidden from our mainstream view. So thank you. Right, so by by older institutions, do you do you mean other like older cultural forms like the novel or things like that? Well, I'm thinking of the people who control New York Review of Books uh -huh. or, or the New York Times who make judgments about things and mm -hmm. therefore um, at one time disparage and other times celebrate. Right. Uh, and so it go it's a two-way street, celebration and disparagement. Okay, and, yes, and I see. And even if you disparage something enough, as one of our doctoral students here at Boston University has shown, it then becomes popular as uh, a focal point right. for unhappy people to counteract <laughs> those who are doing the oh, disparagement. I see what you're saying. Yes. Thank you. Yes, so these things are, you know, cyclical, cultural, Culture is cyclical in so many ways, and uh, something that in one moment is considered low culture becomes much more respectable culture in another. I mean, I mean, the novel is a good example of this historically, right? Which was once quite disparaged and seen as a low cultural form, and then becomes this, you know, kind of highest of of literary forms. We've seen it happen with cinema. Um, you know, it's happening. It's happened with television. I would argue um, over time. And so there's, you know, these things are cyclical and, and often they're motivated by somebody trying to garner kind of attention or um, renown for themselves or some industry trying to garner attention or renown for themselves. Um, so yeah, these things, are, it's not, it's like you say, it's not a one-way process. These things kind of circulate and you never know what is going to be next for kind of falling in the cultural hierarchy and what's going to kind of rise in its place. So, I mean, I think that's why, partly why it's interesting to think about these questions because they're so kind of historically engaged and they're constantly shifting over time. Elena, if it's okay with you, we'll hold on questions yeah, for no you problem. so we can go back to the teller room. But if you have questions, we'll have time okay. after we have uh, kind of Skyped in with our next presenter. production at HBO. He's the co-head of physical production. Um, he joined HBO in 1994 as a vice president of production at HBO Pictures. In 2000, he began also overseeing miniseries. And in 2010, he became head of physical production for all series in the company. He has over 30 years of experience in film and television, and he is a very well-regarded BU Com alumnus. So thank you very much, Jay Rowe. Uh, Rowe. Rowe. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, hold on. Thanks. Okay, hold on. Maybe I need to turn the volume. Yeah, down. we feel like maybe he can hear us. Yeah. Is it? Can you feel that? Yeah. Okay. We can't hear you yet, so hold on. Mr. Rowe, can you, can you 
construction company. Do you need to change the setting? Sorry about this. He can hear us, but we can't hear him. Say something, please. Sorry, we're still not getting. We're working Here's on it. I wish I had the old Indian Head title card. Please stand by. Yeah. Can we? We tried one other thing. Can you speak a little? Say something. something. Keep talking. One more. <laughs> Are you just gonna have to do charades? Is it is it is it this? No. Because he's getting he's getting everything he wanted that is. that the problem is on his end, um, although, no, it's not, because Blue Jeans, nothing is coming from Blue Jeans. I would disconnect and reconnect the call, perhaps. Okay. Or restart, restart Blue Jeans. And I mean, this is obvious for the virtual, but I'm just The sound's coming from the computer.
Some uh, um, inertial is uh, just continuing. Yeah, what I use it to. Cult is of course the community building around, and and the third is is uh, uh, another thing that is uh, a spacious creating about it's being old, but at the same thing time continuity. Uh, I I think these are three different patterns that coexist in this. Yeah, thank you. That's a really interesting way of thinking about. So along the lines of literary culture and this almost being fan fiction that you were speaking of, and uh, soap opera in terms of you know pioneering new media, I wonder if there's been any soap operas that have really utilized the interactive nature of new media. Uh, for example, the Wendy web series from Hannah Carter set in the Alps in the 19th century, mm -hmm. that sort of keeps stalled along the way. Um, there are even TV on the run series episodes that don't even go on to have success. Are soap operas just as different like that? Just on our phone, can we put the phone on the speaker? Not that yes. I know of. Um, like I said, there's this big world of indie of web series production, and I think that um, those kinds of things are, are happening in other genres more than in the soap genre. Um, I really don't know of anything. The most obscure thing is just saying, pay, you know, you fans fund us. You know, <laughs> like, you want to be part of this? Well, help. Seems like you're muted or something like that. Is there? A yeah. Um, yeah. We still don't have a session. I mean, I can dial into the meeting. It's just a matter of getting your voice into um, into this as well. Could you use a different phone? Would that to have a to have a mini guest on it? I can't uh, find the right fashion adapter to have that headphone structure on it. 
Yeah, we can switch to the phone. Yeah, we can dial this number and to this ID and then just. This will still need to be, if you, he won't be able to do two polls at once, and then he won't be able to do any of these microphones, everything will have to go through the phone. So it's the different options that are on the Welcome to Reservationless Plus Conferencing. Enter your conference code, followed by the okay, pound so or hash sign. Okay, so sign. Where's the... Thank you. If you are the leader, press star now. Star, press star. Please wait for your conference to begin. You will now be placed into conference. To mute your line, press star six. To unmute, press pound six. Hello? 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 We can hear you. You can hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? I hear you. Excellent. Wow. Okay. So a few phones and um, a few Skypes, blue jeans. If anybody's um, on Twitter Excellent. right now, we could maybe catch blue jeans without what's going on. Um, <coughs> in any case, I'd like <laughs> to thank you again for being here. Um, I apologize uh, for the delay. Um, we do have, of course, a few questions um, that, that uh, I've prepared, and um, I'm going to pull those up um, right now on another device, and, um, and we'll go through those. So um, first of all, I think um, one of the main things that you can do is to just give us a brief rundown of, of your exact job at HBO right now. Sure, Jacob. And so you can hear me. See me as well, or just hear me? We can see you and hear you. Great, okay. Okay, yes, um, as in the introduction, I heard the brief introduction. Uh, I've been at HBO for years now. Currently, um, I oversee all of the series television production, which at this current time, we have approximately 50 shows in one form of what I call late development, early pre-production, uh, pre-production shooting or post. Um, that is the large bulk of what we, what I'm dealing with in day space. The other thing that I deal with are the worldwide film and television licenses for all of our shows across all of HBO, besides the scripted television, including documentaries, concerts, um, and so on. So uh, that's that's a global perspective on our industry, which is actually very interesting right now. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, um, and of course that's why we're all here today, and, and why you graciously agreed to join us. Um, continuing on to the second question, can you talk about the shifts that have occurred at HBO as it has moved from a cable to an over-the-top content provider? Sure, and I I think the shift to that right now, um, I think it's a fascinating comment. I got to hear the woman speaking before before me, and I look forward to hearing about some of the other presentations. Um, I heard I heard a little bit of what she was saying, but I think what's fascinating, and as I come and have been involved with presentations that you all are doing here today and some panels, it's been fascinating to be living through this transition of distribution right now. And it was stated back in 13 or 14 as Hulu, who is downstairs from here in the Santa Monica offices, as the over-the-top capabilities have 
have, have really come out, there has been a ground shift in our industry. And the way that we've put that on the graph on HBO, and as I've been talking to my colleagues around town, the, the shift from the business side of having to look at deals differently, the way we structure things, the way that money comes in, has caused all of us to feel as though we're on a, on a slightly a seismic ground. So for those of us here in LA, it's quite common. And, and so it, we know what it feels like to be in an earthquake, but when you're actually in that mode of work day in and day out, where we're constantly trying to you know, streamline and have things focused and the, the whole infrastructure for the business is shifting below your feet, it does, it does put some stresses on the business. Um, that being said, I think it's been a very positive thing. I think it's forced us to look at ways of doing things, um, different ways of not only producing things, but putting deals together and so on. And I think it's helping to, to evolve. And I think that's been one of the strengths of HBO through the years is that we're a lean company. We're small, only 3,500 people. And that when you have these technology and distribution, that uh, we're able to shift with. Um, that's not to say that it's necessarily easy, but as we've gone over the top, um, the reality of a broader audience, appeal to a different kind of audience, um, has shifted over onto the production and programming side as well. So I can talk in more specifics about if there are areas. We have a limited amount of time, so I would, I, I can talk in a lot of different areas with specificity, but. I'll start with that as kind of and if you want to, people in the room have specific questions about, I'm, I'm happy to go there. Sure, I think maybe one of the things that um, would be interesting for us to hear is, is how do you think HBO approaches binge watching versus hyper personalization and the process of making recommendations for its viewers? Well, I, I think the whole, I know when Jim, Jim was putting the, uh, the seminar and Together that you all are doing this week, you know it's interesting. Binge watching has been, uh, in some ways, one of the things that has come out of streaming. But uh, what's interesting when you think about binge watching, and I think it's something that we're learning even in this distribution. And, and recently, in the last couple of weeks, uh, Damon Lindelof, who does Leftovers, uh, was talking about the issue of, um, if anything, Lost and some of the shows he was involved with was almost made for binge watching. And I think that one of the lessons that's starting to come out right now as Netflix and, uh, and other people put all this programming out, you know, on, on, a, on a practical level, who has 13 hours straight at any given time on any given day to, to watch that much programming? And I think with some of the data and the analytics that's starting to come out, <coughs> that as we will see this as we get more uh, data directly to us, which of the over the top is that I think some of the initial research out of Netflix shows that the average amount of time that people spend is somewhere in this two to three hour range. I mean, that's, that's just, just humanly to sit down for that period of time is something that along with all the other things becoming in our lives, that the, the notion of being able to sit down and binge watch isn't necessarily how all people are taking that in. And I think in the busy lives that we're in these days, the idea of having programming that comes out on a weekly basis, you have died a chance to digest things, you have a chance to talk about things, um, and that you actually, in a sense, work helping to curate for you the ability to watch a series that you are engaged with or a period of a month or two kind of with your friends. That, that there are some advantages to that. That's not to say that with binge watching one your way. The the one of the interesting things that has come about as a result of watching, certainly in terms of of streaming and not having commercials is its uh, effect on the writing and the actual conceptualization of the shows. And there was actually a panel last week that the Redstone Festival had here in Los Angeles. And one of the, the headlines out of that um, was really, I think, hearing from a writer's perspective that the way that writers are now writing, um, especially as you move away from traditional network advertising, is without ads, with the possibility of somebody binge watching or watching multiple um, episodes, together, that it does change the structural way that you would actually conceive of a script, 
conceive of your character. And so I think the, the, the headline that from a creative point, what the over the top um, distribution and potential binge watching and some of these other things are doing are creating a much wider of creative possibilities for people. And I think that that's what we're seeing the over the top is from a creative standpoint, but the market and the other, the other aspects of, uh, of, of binge watching or certainly streaming of, of content um, is, is allowing a lot of opportunities. Now, where those things are grounded, where they are make sense economically, creatively, and so on, we're still in the early, early stages of that. Yeah, uh, I, I think you can make uh, excellent, a lot of excellent points there that I, I think are very illuminating for, for all of us to, to hear from a production standpoint. Um, I'd like to take the um, chair's prerogative and ask just one more question before we turn things over to our audience members. And part of what, and that is part of what we're doing here today is to talk about the way that streaming television and binge watching and social media all kind of come together in some ways. And so I was wondering if you could speak at all to how um, HBO uses social media and how uh, it, it might be used uh, strategically in order to engage viewers who are, let's say, tweeting about a show as they're watching it, whether it's being streamed live, as it were, or if it's coming uh, asynchronously. Well, I, I think the thing that's interesting about social media is that as we've seen the possibility of the top streaming, there has been um, – a simultaneous um, uh, revolution, or I should say, evolution in social media, and the one of the other largest growth areas, besides the sheer number of technological uh, people who are we're now employing engineers, et cetera, here at HBO. There's been a large growth in that. Is the aspect of social media and the interaction between that in every aspect of what we do, from a distribution standpoint, from a marketing standpoint from a creative programming standpoint. And the, the social media group uh, is having to evolve at the same pace that we are um, as we watch the over the top aspect of things. And uh, the integration of them in all parts of the company, I think that's where the, the, the revolution is, is that uh, technology is the social media area impacted all parts of the company. And so trying to understand how that realize that, take advantage of that, not to be scared by it. Um, something as simple as we used to be able to control, in a sense, you can control anything, you know, if we wanted to, to put out a press release or that we wanted to pick up a show or there was an incident on a show, you'd have to call up the department, we would do a proper press release, and the information in this day and age, there are so many avenues for people getting information. It's more about us being clear to ourselves what is the information we want to go out and then it starts to go. And I think that that's the, the aspects of social media is that so much of it is out of your control. How do you work with it and how do you manage it in a way that, that is positive and contributing? and is, is helpful. Um, so it's, it's, I think my headline in the social media is that it, it, is, it, is, it is grown and there are so many possibilities right now, it's a, it's a big area of focus for us. Okay, that's, not, that's um, definitely important. I guess um, we have uh, at least one question at the moment from the audience. Can we, can we put her on a, a microphone? Okay, and just let us know if you can't hear for some reason. You're going to probably have to moderate it, Mr. Jacob, so and, uh, fine. Yeah, okay, just a moment. She sure. To come and pose the question herself so we don't um, literally uh, get lost in sure. translation uh, or playing telephone. Yep. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Thank you for very, coming Very, very good. There I am. Hi, I'm Lisa Perkins. Sure. Um, I have a question for you about piracy and some network execs. 
suggest that HBO or, or suggest that HBO had said that Game of Thrones being potentially the most pirated show um, was better than an Emmy. So I'm wondering if some of your adaptations to this seismic ground, as you called it, um, are, are efforts to kind of make those pirates legitimate uh, monetized viewers. Well, well, I, I think the, the model that I would go back to is the music industry when in the early days of Napster and, and so on, there was a, a ground shift going on. And, and people looked at the piracy aspect of things. And once there was a, you know, a, a, a more legitimate way of dealing with technology and focusing people, it became beneficial to everybody. And I think that the, the, the aspect of piracy from our sensitivity is that clearly there is a thirst. And I think that that's one of the things with HBO because of, before we went over the top, again, there, 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 it's wonderful to be to have product, whether it be Game of Thrones or many of the other shows that we do, be that people something that people want. And given the amount of piracy that was going on with it, it's clearly that there's a thirst to get that out there to people. And I think that what the way we look at going over the top and the evolving technological aspect of things is how do you maintain an economic structure? that allows us to produce the quality of programming that we do at the level we do, but evolve into a world that better programming out to more, more people. And so we have traditional ways of having done that through, through traditional distribution deals and so on and so forth, which we don't want to leave behind, but, but with the advent of, of technology and things like HBO Go and HBO Now, we want to be able to get it out to more and more people around the world. I think it's a fascinating statistic, uh, and, and this, this comes into the concept a little bit with the potential AT&T merger, which I can't really talk too much about today. But certainly with the advent and the possibility of 3.5 billion people at, you know, connected to Wi-Fi by the end of the decade, we certainly want to be able to access those people with our programming. And so we have to be smart how to do that in a way that allows it to get them but still maintain the economic models that allow us to have the money to be able to produce the programming that we do. So the piracy, I think, the headline of the piracy, is there, it said to us people want our product. It's up to us to get it to them in a way that benefits them and benefits us. Okay, thanks much, Dave. We have another question from our audience who uh, – um, Mark Stewart from the University of Amsterdam, who actually is presenting later today on the topic of piracy. Hi there. Um, my question actually isn't to do with piracy. I just wanted to uh, ask about the way that when you're developing content for HBO Now, whether or not you're bringing into consideration the fact that it will have a secondary or ongoing distribution on HBO Go, and it's sort of, you know, that, that ongoing secondary market, or whether as you're developing, you're still mainly thinking about the, the linear broadcast access at time of, of broadcast as part of the development process. At, at this point, the focus is on making sure that we do programming and that the distribution model in and of itself is something that we will be sensitive to but the aspect of doing something specifically for a distribution model first and worrying about the quality later on is not in our culture and ethos. And we, we are taking, we experiment and we're open and one of the things that these days, the interest in filmmakers and the creators as they come to us with the advent of movie and things such as things to say, listen, are there things we can do? Where we've seen a lot of this social media side of things, where creators are now very tuned into social media, the idea of literally live blogging from the set, making pe people feel part of the creative process, um, the, 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 the use of followers on talents and so on and so forth, those areas, they, they've, they've started to become part of that process. In terms of whether it's timed or linear, again, that's a distribution question. And, and from a creative technological standpoint, um, I 
the things which were we were evolving into early on at HBO, where just the idea of doing programming without commercials at the time was revolutionary, 15, 20 years ago. And now it's almost part of the culture. And it was one of the reasons why we were able to do programming so different back then. I think some of the more subtle areas when we talk about HBO going out is the idea of instead of having the program for 30 minutes or 60 minutes, you know, take for instance Vice Daily News right now, which is technically a half hour news show. To this date, I've been involved with every podcast. I don't think there's one show that's 30 minutes. Sometimes it's eight, sometimes it's 24, sometimes it's 26. You know, the, 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 it gives the, gives the programmer the flexibility to have it be the right length of the news of the day that they're doing and not be having to, to have it fit into a time slot. So I think it's those kinds of, of that kind of freedom that, that you still want people to realize it's going to be on a certain time. So again, I think Vice Daily News, and I think for those of you that haven't seen it, I would encourage you to see it. It, it, it is the first directly live stream show that comes out of HBO. It live streams at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time, 30 minutes with, with 10 streams live on the Lydia channel now. And then following that, you can then immediately start to stream the show as soon as it's over. So watching people can interact with an interactive element, um, which we're just beginning to play around with. So these are we are playing with these things, but obviously when we put something up, we need to attract people and so forth. So we're, we're, we're we highly curate um, the, the programming the eyes on what we watch and how we put it. So there's a sensitivity to ensure that what we do is by a certain integrity. I hope that answers the question. I, I think so. I mean, uh, you can't see, but I, I'm watching the audience and a lot of nodding. So um, um, I think we'll wrap Great. up with just one last question. Um, Jim, did you want to yeah, offer something? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's great that you're able to do this and that uh, it's a very similar experience to how we do this with uh, the work that you're doing, and actually the work that you're doing with uh, the children and the children and the information. Okay, Jim. So our last question is from Jim Katz, our uh, Director of Emerging Media Studies here, and, and he first of all wants to thank you for being here, and then secondly, uh, raise the issue of international particularly on the, the impact of China and its uh, audience and viewership, um, and what effect, if any, that might have on what you're producing, how you're distributing, and how HBO sees that process shaping up. Um, I think one of the, the things that I've seen in the last certainly five years, though it's coming for 10, and we are now there, <coughs> both on the distribution and the production side, is that we are now in a global time. And the idea now of us having interest in other cultures, certainly from a technological standpoint, we've seen the walls go down, right, with the internet. And the idea of us to, and again, us want to put our programming out to China, trying theatrical movies they get into China for years. And we're still trying to figure out how to make that work. But now there's a, a, a fascination for other cultures and through media to be able to share. We're all in this world together now, right? We're all as interconnected as we've ever been. And what better way to understand other people is through their media and, and, and television and films and, and, and art. And as I go around and produce, the challenge now for, for us is how do we break those walls down? And it's kind of ironic time when we're actually trying to put walls up that actually we, we're at a point where we, we can communicate with people in a stronger way than ever before. And I was recently over in China at the end of last year. We did two movies with our HBO Asia unit in China. And I went to the set um, in, in um, uh, just a few hours outside of Shanghai. And I walked onto the set, and I felt like I was on a set – literally over at Sony Studios. The dynamic, the creative process, the, the spirit, the passion with what people were doing was the same way that I walked when I walked into a set here in the United States. 
And yet the cultural difference was still there. We wanted to share, but still language issues. And the, the, the trust of wanting to be able to work with these people, but them trusting us and us trusting them. It, it, I, I could see it in how the business deals were put together and how the communication was going on. It, that at the end of the day, we have many similarities, but we still have to break these walls down and form these aspects of trust. I think we have a thirst for that, and I think that the technology is now there. But it's still the human side of coming up with ways of, of getting people to trust you business-wise. Um, and the stories even to be told. We, we, we've talked about the stories. Look at the things in China. And the way that they've been brought up culturally, right, socially, is different from us. So the stories are, are the, the stories that they, they have to tell are different. But as we listen to their story, I think there's a lot for us to learn. The production tools and the technology are allowing for us to be connected. So, so it's about us going out there, breaking those walls down, and actually working with those people. And I'm, I'm, you know, it's an exciting time to do that. And I think with us, Netflix, we want we want to be deals with these people. We want to be working with them. And so now it's about breaking those walls down, and making it happen. It just takes time. Um, well, with that, I think um, we, we've gone just a little bit over time. I want to thank you once again for being here. I want to thank you so much for your patience, and I want to thank our audience for participating with us and also seeing us through the technical difficulties. Thanks so much. Uh, wishing you a, a great day, and um, be in touch as much as we can. Thank you. I, I thank you for putting this conference together. Um, I w I'm sorry I couldn't be there. But I'm very interested in hearing about some of the speeches that have been done. It is a total um, a cult, cultural and technological revolution we're in the midst of. And whether it's you all or myself, the world is changing around us, and it's a great time to be able to share and bring these things together. I applaud Jim and BU for um, putting these kinds of, of conferences together and doing more of this, and look forward to participating in the future. And I really do want to hear about many of the presentations that were there and uh, look forward to, to, to hearing about that in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm, I'm going to uh, end the call. Thank you uh, so much for the use of your phone. Thank you all of you for bearing with us. This has put us um, uh, about 10 minutes behind schedule. Um, um, normally that would be a problem, but we actually had one of our short rearrangement in our schedule because of a present presenter who couldn't make it, so I think we'll be just fine. Why don't we take about 15 minutes now to um, gather ourselves, use the restroom, maybe there's coffee um, to be had, and then we'll have our pre presenters for the next panel come up, get things arranged, and then we'll, we'll go forward. Thanks very much. as a, it's called blue jeans and, and it's something they sent to me. I'm like, well, should we just do Skype? And they said, well, we use blue jeans. I'm like, well, whatever. Tried it yesterday, like totally fine. Did you go through a console or is it direct? Because I've tried to do that where I'm at. And the videos were. Yeah. Thanks so much. Oh, uh, my pleasure. Lovely job. Thank and especially um, helping us as we were. Oh, no problem. So, so you can see my, my prerogative in having having some, some things that happen in an event of technical difficulty.
describing. However, it's a term that everyone understands and it's a lot quicker to say than unsanctioned media access over and over again. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out as a caveat. I'm still working through how best to, to work with this, but um, yeah. So in uh, 2010, uh, Gail DeCosnick published a white paper through the Convergence Culture Consortium, which is based in the Comparative Media Studies Department at MIT. And the paper was provocatively titled Piracy is the Future of Television, very knowingly provocatively titled, and very clearly laid out the benefits that piracy and its different versions offers to users over the traditional sanctioned modes of access. Today, I'm here to bring my own provocation, taking the Cosnick's ideas and reassessing them in the light of the changes and shifts of technologies and practices in the past seven years. So the question is, is piracy still the future of television in the age of television streaming? So what I'm going to do is spend the first half running through what Gail de Kosnick laid out and sort of her suggestions and then sort of assess that in light of recent shifts. So de Kosnick laid out the possibilities offered through both subscription and transactional video on demand, which I tend to shorten to SVOD and TVOD just for simplicity. Um, she discussed, looked, looked at providers such as iTunes, Hulu, Amazon, Netflix, discussing pricing structures and how each provider allowed users to access content. At the point she wrote it, the major players had been running for two to three years and were still developing their own strategies and practices. However, de Kosnick does note that all the streaming offerings she describes are geo-restricted to the United States, which is a, you know, a crucial point. Uh, de Kosnick goes on to lay out the unsanctioned ways that television content might be accessed, focusing on BitTorrent and sites with which host unsanctioned streaming, naming YouTube as an exemplar. Uh, then critically, she continues in order to describe the several reasons why a single user might find pirate downloading superior to legal downloading and streaming options. It's from these specific reasons that my argument today is formulated questioning whether these desires are still best allowed for by unsanctioned forms of access, and whether new desires might have developed in the interim seven years, which are better provided by one mode of provision or another. So the first benefit that the Cosnic raises is single search. Yeah. Um, as she notes in 2010, no quote, no one legal site makes available all popular television. She highlights how any fan of a given genre will need to access two to three sites sliding between streaming and downloading in order to access major series in their preferred style. In contrast, the Cosmic highlights the fact that pirate sites do not differentiate by network. On a standard torrent site, a single search engine will provide access to major content from all the US broadcast and cable networks, as well as some from the UK and other sources. In addition to this, De Kosnick also points out the benefit of simple indexing. This refers to the fact that torrent sites can usually be filtered by media type, such as TV series, and, will, can, and also usually will offer the most popular and or the most recently uploaded files first, meaning that a user can look at a single page in order to determine the available files most likely to be of interest. Uh, uniform software and interface is the next value-added proposition offered by unsanctioned television access, according to DeCosnick. Uh, given that those accessing television through unsanctioned means do so regularly, the process is almost identical no matter which torrent site is used. The user has already gone through the process of setting up their system to be able to download using torrent files and to play the subsequent video files. Then the actual process of finding and utilizing the torrent files is remarkably similar even if the user moved from one torrent search engine to another. In contrast, the Cosnic notes that the unique, different unique apps, which must often be used by individual sanctioned sites in order to maintain their own DRM requirements and the smoothness of the interface. In order to be able to access even just a small number of series, it's conceivable that a user might need to, to use at least two or three different applications, which all operate differently with a different feature set. There are also significant roadblocks in place depending on the type of device or operating system that's being used, 
with Android devices unable to use Adobe Flash Player, and a number of sanctioned sites not having working applications or interfaces for less common operating systems such as Linux. File portability is a key element for the Cosmic. The ability to watch content in multiple spaces on multiple devices. An attempt to replicate the portability that was seen to exist with physical copies of audiovisual content such as DVDs. The Cosmic notes the limited potential that does exist for files to be transferred between approved devices and in some cases to be stored in digital lockers, but clearly highlights the limitations that exist compared to pirated files which are lacking in DRM and which usually conform to one of two or three file types and codec specifications, allowing to be, them to be played by most devices and on most systems. For the Cosmic, piracy frees the user from the necessity to own a TV set at all. Content availability also plays a key role in this section, as she notes the limited availability of content on sanctioned services is often dwarfed by the availability of entire series that are unsanctioned. Uh, access to global television comes next, referring to the fact that most non-US content was not available within the US through sanctioned means, but also that non-US viewers were beholden to content windows at the very least before US series were available to them. The Cosnick describes piracy as, quote, a global enterprise, highlighting the irrelevance that national borders play in the transnational flows of data. And, uh, no, that's right. A crucial point raised by the Cosnick is that of personal archives. She highlights that television has long been seen as an ephemeral medium, but, now, but that there are now some users who desire to keep their own archives of television content in digital form, just as they might have on VHS or DVD previously. She notes the benefit that digital storage has over these forms, uh, however, including ease of backup, enhanced portability, limitless replicability, improved potential for cataloging, and greater protection from damage or loss. And finally, the Cosmic points out that piracy is low cost and commercial free and that users do not usually pay for unsanctioned access to specific content, and instead the costs involved are usually for hardware or for specific services which broadly allow for more convenient access, etc. So that lays out where the Cosmic saw things in 2010, making recommendations to the television industry that they needed to adapt to the model established by piracy or risk finding themselves increasingly made obsolete by the improved flexibility offered by the unsanctioned access model. And where do we find ourselves in 2017? Have the Cosmic's predictions been borne out? Have industries risen to the challenge? I'm gonna run through the key elements of her argument point by point again in order to best paint an accurate picture of whether we can still see piracy as the future of television. The Cosmic's first point, single search, is probably the most problematic factor still remaining in 2017. Here, the situation has actually become notably worse as the sanctioned media spectrum has seen increased fragmentation. As companies like CBS pull their content from Hulu and begin to offer their own streaming services, users require a suite of subscriptions just to be able to access the current streaming content, and probably several more in order to have access to the back catalogue that's available. Sites such as Netflix are beginning to contract their own offerings as the licensing market becomes more competitive, meaning that users not only must pay for more access, but they frequently have to spend considerable time hunting in order to find the service that's offering the content that they desire. There have been rumors over recent years that a company such as Google might offer a global search engine to display where specific content might be available and to play it if the appropriate subscription is owned, but these have yet to come to fruition. Uh, uniform software and interface is another point worth reconsidering in 2017. However, while the interfaces for the major TVOD and XVOD services are all unique, I would argue that they have mostly adopted the interfa interface practices of common websites. Ways of ac to, to access content will usually be relatively clear to anyone used to accessing a variety of web-based services. In addition, most of the systems are also designed to work with some sort of remote control-based interface, not just a mouse and keyboard or touchscreen interface, which often simplifies the user experience. File portability represents another area where unsanctioned access still easily outstrips the official channels. It's a contractual requirement for almost any new provider of TVOD downloadable content that it be restricted 
by DRM in order to prevent easy sharing. However, the effect of this is also to prevent portability in ways which would be completely legal were it not for the technical restrictions imposed by the DRM. Access to global TV continues to be an issue in many ways for the television industry, although one for which some providers are seeking solutions. Geo restrictions are still significant barriers to access to global television, with blocked access to Hulu outside the US or to the BBC iPlayer outside the UK serving as two ideal examples. These restrictions can be avoided through the use of VPNs or IP spoofing software, leading to the site the site's belief that the user is actually based within an acceptable locale. But I would contend that this should still be considered unsanctioned access. Another reason I prefer that term over piracy. Personal archives continue to be a benefit offered by unsanctioned access that is not offered by traditional means. While two TVOD services do, on the surface, appear to offer this potential, their offerings are frequently limited to certain types of television, and they are still burdened with DRM, meaning that should the provider cease to operate or choose to not offer the system which authorizes their decryption, then the archive becomes obsolete. The final point is that of the content being low cost and commercial free. This is where current sanctioned services have, to an extent, responded to the threat posed by piracy. The offerings of any given SVOD service are usually relatively reasonable on a monthly basis, probably comparable to the sort of extra costs that those making use of unsanctioned forms of access might be paying for some of the additional services to facilitate the practice. So cost is not necessarily a driving factor behind why people are choosing to access these through unsanctioned access methods. So to wrap up, Gail de Kosnick's work seven years ago was certainly a provocation speaking boldly to the television industry about the pleasures and potential that piracy offered over their system, and challenging them to meet the offerings or to risk losing market share. Seven years on, her work seems to have been almost prescient, as the industry has continued on down similar paths, and, sp and specifically television piracy has continued to be a small but significant percentage of the audience. Ease of access and the cultural ubiquity of sites such as Netflix do offer a relatively easy venue for access for those viewers who just want to have some content available, but for viewers who desired a broader range of content, specific content, or more timely access, the options become far more complicated. The offerings available from unsanctioned sources still provide almost all the benefits highlighted by the Cosmic in ways which traditional sources still do not compete with. Gail the Cosmic's seven-year-old work proves to be still just as relevant in a developing television landscape and will continue to inflect further work into the unsanctioned access to television content and the choices made by users in how to access that content. Our next panelist is from the University of Central Florida, Kelly Merrill, presenting Tuning in at eight or for eight hours, predictors of binge watching. Okay, so today we've been throwing around binge watching a lot. We've been talking about how we are usually binge watching all the time and there it's a relatively new way of viewing and that essentially millennials are the ones that are binge watching the most. But we can't forget about appointment viewing, which is one of the forms of viewing that has been around for arguably the longest. And so what my um, colleagues and I, we looked at essentially predictors that would affect the, the frequency as to which someone might binge watch or as to why someone might appointment view. And some of the frequent, um, some of the factors that we looked at were age, habit, multitasking, and addiction. So within the literature, there's been a lot of differences between the, um, how appointment viewing can be relevant and binge watching can be relevant. For example, within the rise of cord cutting, we are switching to a lot of streaming devices and we're looking at Hulu and Amazon and um, streaming devices such, such as those that make more people want to binge watch instead of appointment viewing. 
Additionally, the accessibility. Appointment viewing, you have to be there live as it airs, and you have to be present at that time. Whereas with binge watching, you can open up your computer or, anything, or your cell phone and stuff like that, and you can binge watch the content at that time. Additionally, there's this one concept called co-viewing, where it states that you're viewing with other people. So you and your friends or your colleagues are watching at one time. And with appointment viewing, it's a lot easier because you can sit down and sit during that 30 minute um, TV show or one hour TV show. Whereas with binge watching, you have to sit down with that person for a long period of time and it's not very likely. Also off of that concept, we have connected viewing where essentially you're looking at a second screen or you're doing another task while you're viewing the content. And with appointment viewing, it's a lot easier to connect um, on devices such as your phone and go on social media websites such as Twitter where you can tweet about where you're viewing, whereas with binge watching, it's not necessarily true that you're watching at the same time as others are watching. We also have this one thing called mega events where a mega event is essentially a big event that happens within not very frequently. For example, a Super Bowl could be an example of a mega event as well as the Olympics. And so it's a lot easier to appointment view those because they only come on at specific times, whereas if you were binge watching something like that, definitely can't watch a lot of seasons of the Super Bowl over and over. And then also the time. So appointment viewing, as I mentioned, it's sometimes you're only there for 30 minutes, an hour. It's very short and it's very quick. Whereas binge watching, again, you have, you have long periods of time where you're watching multiple episodes sequentially. So it takes up a lot of time. And then lastly, there's this one concept called the fear of missing out. And it applies to both forms of viewing, appointment viewing and binge watching. Whereas if your appointment view tonight because you want to watch your favorite show, you want to make sure that you don't miss out on the dialogue that you're going to have with your colleagues and your friends the next day. And then the same can be said with binge watching. You binge watch an entire season because you don't want to disrupt your narrative or you want to talk about your friends about where you were viewing the night before. So then with both of these viewings, these modes of viewings, we look at a theoretical approach with uses and gratifications and then also um, habitual television viewing. And then uses and gratifications, they state that habit is essentially a motive for the audience to actively engage in television viewing. And it looks at the audience as an active, ha having an active role. Whereas habit looks at the opposite of the audience having a passive role. And so habit, they, it's concerned with the creation of media habits and the strength of media habits. Whereas you, you develop over time your habit, your media habit essentially to a continued exposure of a certain television content and that's how the habit is obtained and then over time the habit strengthens. Okay, so one thing that we were um, specifically interested in was these different factors of our audience and how it affected their frequency uh, of whether they were appointment viewing or whether they were binge watching. And so age, we hear all the time that um, millennials and younger people are usually the ones that are binge watching, so it's something that we want to look into, as well as multitasking, whether you're working on different screens at once or if you're doing multiple tasks at once while you're watching. Self-control, whether you have control over your viewing habits. We all know that Netflix has that one button that just allows you to continue watching your episodes and whether that is a factor in self-control or not for the individuals. And then indi uh, addiction, which as I mentioned before is an involuntary and out of control habit that we also were interested in for our population. So we conducted a study with two different samples. One sample was a sample of all college students, 373 college students. The average age was 22. And then the adult sample, we had 421 adults. The average age was 49 and they ranged between 25 and 81 years old. And then so what we did, we measured the types of viewing that they had. So whether they, their frequency of appointment viewing and their frequency of binge watching as well as the factors that were associated with them that I've mentioned before, which included age, multitasking, um, self-control, and addiction. And then we utilized a survey in order to question them about their viewing habits, as well as their um, control, their multitasking, and such involved with their appointment viewing and their binge watching. So this is just a little bit of descriptives about the, the sample as a whole, both samples. And you can see that 29% of our samples stated that they never appointment view, compared to only seven, um, a little bit over 7% saying that they never, oh, I'm sorry, never appointment viewed where it was over 8%, and then for binge watching, we saw that it was 
over 19%. So it's stating that our participants are saying that they don't binge watch, um, that they never, more never binge watch compared to appointment viewing. And then we see those that do it daily, we have a lot uh, larger percentage for appointment viewing where it's over 29% that daily um, appointment view compared to only a little bit over seven, um, a little bit less than 8% that say that they binge watch on a daily basis. So what we did was we ran regressions uh, after controlling the age and the sex of the multitasking habit addiction and self-control of these individuals and we found it to be significant for um, college, the college student sample where it essentially age, multitasking habit, addiction and self-control are very important factors in predicting whether they, their frequency of whether they're appointment viewing or not. Whereas we did not find the same for our adult sample. The only thing that we found significant was the addiction and the self-control. And also important to note is that the, the age of the student sample, the younger the student, the more likely that they were frequent to appointment view. And then the same we did for the binge watching. We looked at regressions that we ran for our binge watching with our, the frequency that they binge watch compared to the student sample and the adult sample. And we found that habit is actually one of the biggest, if not the largest predictor of why someone, the frequency of why someone would appoint or why someone would binge watch. But for the student sample, we also found that self-reported addiction was also um, a factor in the frequency of their binge watching. And then also for the adult sample, we found that the younger adults, they had a higher frequency of binge watching, which kind of goes with what previous literature says about the younger audiences are binge watching more than the older audiences. And so some of the key points from the results that we found from our study was that appointment viewing is essentially the age differences. It, 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 um, it shows up and before if you look at the appointment viewing here, you can see that the variance for the student sample is about 17%. We were able to account for 17.4% of the variance for the student sample, whereas for the adult sample, we were only able to account for about 4%. So we don't necessarily know what factors are important for the adult sample, but we, do, we did investigate the factors that are important important for the student sample. And like I mentioned before, the age. That is there, it says the age. The younger the age, um, it does equate to the frequency of their appointment viewing. And like I just mentioned, age was not a, uh, a predictor of the frequency in the adult sample. And we don't necessarily have a lot of factors that are predicting the frequency that adults are appointment viewing. And then, so the student sample, as I mentioned before, is also motivated by a greater habit, multitasking while viewing, TV, di TV addiction, and a lack of self-control. And then with binge watching, as you've seen in this right here, you can see that the beta weights for habit are very large and that it is a very significant predictor in determining whether or not the students will binge watch as well as the adults will binge watch. And then the variance that we accounted for for the students is about 34%, and then for the adults it's 37%. So it's very significant findings that we found that the, um, the predictors of why someone might binge watch more than other people. And then so it's needless to say that it's unlikely that it's just a millennial thing as we found that habit does have a role in why adults binge watch as well. And so one of the limitations to our study was that our, our adult participants were recruited through a Qualtrics panel and essentially adults that are recruited through that way, they are, it's argued, you can argue that essentially they have a more involvement with technology and that they have a better understanding of some of these concepts compared to the entire population of adults as a whole. But then we do have some ongoing questions that we want to look at for possibly future studies and we wanna know how else can we conceptualize and operationalize these modes of viewing and other factors that might Im influence appointment viewing because as, as you've seen earlier, there wasn't very much factors that we found for that could account for the variance of why the adults are appointment viewing. And then also something to think about is even technology differences because nowadays you can look at, you can binge watch or even um, on your phone, you can do it on a tablet or even on the television or even the laptop. So technology differences is something that we should look into. And then there should be a further investigation of habit because it looks at the audience as a passive, as having a passive role, whereas you see grad participants has always been looking at the audience as having a, a more active role. So these are some of the things that we are essentially looking into for developing our study and looking further for more information. Thank you.
panelist is Sarah Erickson from the University of Michigan with her work, An Experimental Examination of Binge Washing and Narrative Engagement. stability now. Okay, hi, um, thank you so much for including me in this uh, workshop. I'm really excited to be here to present a bit of work that uh, colleagues and I have been working on to look at the role of binge watching in media effects and how we understand media. Um, one of the things we've done is this experiment to look at binge watching and narrative engagement and that's why we're presenting today. As we know and we've talked about a bit today, people are consuming more television content at a faster pace than ever before. According to a survey in 2013, so about four years ago, over 61% of Netflix users reported binge watching regularly. At that time, that was over 30 million people. Um, and I'm sure we'll continue to discuss, and I'll sort of end with some questions about this as well, but um, how we might define binge watching and what we really mean by binge watching. But for the purpose of this study, um, we consider binge watching based on some survey data that we had put together as watching three episodes of the same show within a relatively short period of time. And I'll, I'll get more into that. but. Um, Media critics have argued that binge watching is a natural result of the technological structure of streaming sites. For example, as we've talked about, Netflix releases entire seasons of programming at once, and the and episode pl automatically plays when you are done watching it about 15 seconds later. Um, these technological characteristics are often then combined with narrative techniques such as the use of cliffhangers or serial emotional narratives to further encourage binge watching. So we have this phenomenon that's happening, um, but what does it mean for our understanding of media engagement? and how audiences are involved in media. In the effects literature, increased engagement is associated with stronger effects of media on consumers. Audiences also report seeking out and enjoying engaging media. This project examines the role of binge watching and media engagement across two common constructs, narrative transportation and parasocial relationships. Narrative transportation is defined as the phenomenological experience of escaping into the world of a narrative. It is a desired state that includes the sense of leaving the world of origin, and transportation theory um, from Green and Brock suggests that the more a viewer is carried into the reality of media narratives, the higher their levels of enjoyment and engagement. This ability to transport into a narrative is positively impacted by repeated exposure and can be negatively impacted by intervening factors that disrupt this process of exposure. Binge watching maximizes this, the sort of uh, continued exposure, repeated exposure, while minimizing intervening, intervening factors. Another common measure of media engagement and involvement with narratives is the development of parasocial relationships. Horton and Wall define parasocial relationships as relationships with media figures that are functionally similar to relationships with real people. Um, these relationships are symbolic in nature, characterized by repeated exposure, missing characters when they're gone, perceiving friendship, and perceiving an intimate bond with a character or media figure. Parasocial relationships are the natural result of engagement with narrative media and offered entered into through simple exposure. Um, binge watching increases the speed of relationship development because we know in interpersonal relationships, one of the ways that relationships develop is through disclosure of information. And through binge watching, that's happening faster. Um, so you, the speed of watching is, is increasing the speed of relationship development is our theory. Um, both parasocial relationships and transportation have been shown to increase the effects of media content on viewers' beliefs, be behaviors, and attitudes, and to play a role in viewer interpretation and meaning making in response to narrative media. To the extent that binge watching as compared to more traditional power, uh, patterns of viewing, like serial viewing, um, facilitates these types of media engagement, it's plausible that it also enhances the effects, positive and negative, of media content on viewers. So based on all of that, we put, had a series of hypotheses of what we expected. Um, we expected, first of all, that parasocial relationship strength would be related to narrative transportation. These two constructs have been shown to be related you know, very consistently um, by multiple researchers, so we expected that in the sample. We also expected that participants in, um, who binge watch would report higher levels of transportation into a media narrative than those who did not. That participants who binge watch would report stronger parasocial relationships than those who were in the, serial, the serialized condition, and I'll get into the conditions in a minute. Um, 
And then finally, we had this question, which was, is this relationship development short-lived? Is it, oh, okay, we built this relationship really fast, but now I'm not gonna interact with this character anymore because I've watched all these episodes and I'm done, or does it endure beyond that binge-watching episode or exposure? Um, so we had this question, are changes in the strength of parasocial relationships, if we find any, enduring or fleeting? Um, we had an experiment that had sort of five stages. Um, we started with a pre-survey, went to assign, participants were randomly assigned to a binge or non-binge condition. They then were exposed to a media narrative and then took a post-survey measuring their parasocial relationships with their favorite character and their um, levels of, of transportation. And then a week later they had another, they completed another survey to see whether that any changes may have endured. Our sample was 77 undergraduate students at the University of Michigan. Uh, predominantly white women um, of an upper middle class background, which reflects the University of Michigan uh, population, certainly in the comm department at least. Um, <coughs> our design was a two by two design. We had the binge condition and the non-binge condition as our experimental um, conditions. And then we used two different narratives um, because we wanted to look beyond the impacts of a specific, specific narrative and instead try to draw larger conclusions about the phenomenon. Um, we did a series of pretests of, by showing pilots to undergraduate students of shows that were popular in the early 2000s and that targeted adolescents and emerging adults because we wanted narratives that were directed at that audience. Um, and we wanted to balance out sort of how much they knew about the narrative, whether they were familiar with the narrative, with whether they liked it or not. So we wanted to find shows that they did not know about and had not seen before, but that when they watched the pilot, they really liked them. And so coming out of that, we ended up with um, Felicity and Everwood as our two narratives. Um, which then participants were placed um, into one of the, those categories, again, randomly. So just to map out, because th this can get a little bit uh, complicated, even for, like, for me to pay attention to figure out and manage, as you can imagine. Um, we had, in the binge condition, participants were with us for two weeks, not with us, but were participating for two weeks. In the first week, they watched the first three episodes of each of their assigned series. They had three days to do that. So we said, you know, three episodes in, within a three day period. Um, they then completed the survey about their parasocial relationship with their favorite character and their transportation into that narrative. And then a week later, we contacted the, them again and asked them to complete a follow-up survey about parasocial relationships. In the control condition, they were working with us for four weeks. Uh, the first week, they watched one episode, the second week they watched another episode, the third week they watched another episode and completed the survey. Um, and we gave them three days to watch each episode because um, we wanted to be somewhat flexible, but we also wanted to make sure that there were at least four days in between viewing any two episodes, if that makes sense, to try to at least space it out to as close to a week as we could get. And then again, they completed the follow-up survey. So 91% of our participants had never heard of the show that they were assigned. This is a different sample than the pilot sample. Um, and only one had previously seen their assigned show and that participant was removed from any analyses. Approximately half of the participants reported that they really liked their show. 88% um, at least liked their show a little, so they were engaged in some way in these narratives. Um, we didn't see any significant differ differences across Felicity versus Everwood, so we may be sort of done talking about that and we just focus on the binge versus non-binge. Uh, we found that binge watching was positively related to liking a show having stronger parasocial relationships and higher levels of state transportation. And so to go back to our hypotheses, we did find that there is a relationship between parasocial relationships and state transportation as we expected, a very strong correlation. We also found that both are predicted by binge watching. So being in the binge watching condi condition led to stronger parasocial relationships and higher levels of state transportation. We're also a bit interested in how this might work. Um, Based on the fact that these participants had not encountered these characters before, we thought perhaps there might be some sort of mediation going on where binge watching was increasing transportation, which then increased parasocial relationships. So we tested a mediation model and found that um, there is a significant indirect effect of binge watching on parasocial relationships going through that transportation. Now, some of the actors from Everwood and Felicity are still famous today. They might be familiar to people. So it is possible they came in with a parasocial relationship already. Um, and then in which case it's possible that this model is, would not um, adequately explain their experience. So this is our sort of first pass theoretically of what we think is going on. <coughs> and just a quick summary to answer that final question, is this enduring or not? Um, the first two on, the, on your left <laughs> um, 
show the transportation and parasocial relationship scores right after viewing, and then all the way on the right is a week after viewing. You can see that the, the effect is consistent, um, that being binge watching produced these stronger parasocial relationships and higher levels of transportation. We also then can likely conclude that this might increase media engagement. This indicates increased engagement, which could then have imp impacts on media effects and interpretation. Um, so this again reinforces this idea of looking not just at what we're watching, but how we're watching, which I think is a big theme we're going to have here. Um, of course, this study is limited by its experimental design. Um, we made these students watch these particular shows, um, and so we need to look at some more ecologically valid approaches um, to address sort of why we're watching and how that might impact it. So we heard a little bit about that from Kelly, um, and I think also talking about the use and gratification side is important. Um, and we know that self-selection matters in transportation. If you pick a show to watch, you would likely to be more transported into it than if someone says, you must watch this show. Um, so we might expect even stronger effects in, in a self-selected um, narrative. Um, also, we only looked at college students, and so obviously we need to think sort of beyond that scope in research. Um, the thing I want to sort of leave you with, and I'm going to do the thing that you're really not supposed to do, which is make a whole argument and end with a bigger question than the one you started with. Um, but I think we, we, you know, I'm hoping that as part of this workshop, we can wrestle a little bit more with the definition of binge watching. Um, I was interested to hear Jay Rowey talk about people don't have time to sit for 13 hours and watch a show, um, because I'm not sure that that's how I was conceptualizing binge watching. Um, what about watching two or like a season over a week or something like that, right? Um, and so I've been working with a couple of uh, co-authors on a larger project trying to figure out how we might empirically talk about binge watching. Um, and, and we sort of come up with this idea that it maybe is just something that's defined by the person watching. They decide I'm binge watching and that is what they then do. And so how do we as, as researchers begin to address binge watching as an empirical topic? Um, so <laughs> a little bit of an aside at the end, but uh, thank you so much. Um, Really cool story, very quickly. Hannah Bile is an undergraduate student at the University of Michigan who, after I gave a um, guest lecture on parasocial relationships, came up to me and said, do you think binge watching increases parasocial relationships? And we said, we don't know. And thus was born this line of research and she, does, she sort of designed and facilitated the experiment. So I thought it was cool to have the undergraduate student involved. to all of our panelists. I'm now going to turn things over to Dr. James Patz of Boston University, and he's going to be our lead discussion for this panel. Thank you very much, Brittany, and thank you panelists for your insightful and I think at times highly provocative contribution. Uh, I think one of the remarkable aspects about this panel is that the three levels of analysis that were brought to bear. So we have a um, interpretive policy related presentation, we have a survey presentation, we have an experimental design presentation. And I think that speaks very well to the purpose of what we're trying to do here today, which is to bring multiple perspectives onto the phenomena of streaming consumption of media. I'd like to maybe go in the same order as the presentations to uh, offer some thoughts on what was said. And I think, uh, if I may, Mark Stewart, your talk um, cast all the advantages of um, unsanctioned access for the consumer. And obviously, um, there are all those benefits, and you, you did, a, I thought, a good job of reprising the Cosmic's uh, comments. But I couldn't help but to think uh, it's a little bit like um, happy hours at bars. So isn't it great that there are happy hours at bars and people can come in and have uh, heavily discounted drinks or free drinks and lots of appetizers? And it might be useful to look at the other side of the coin. Why is it that we have these restrictions? We, why do they have these restrictions on consumers? And 
Uh, we heard a little bit about that earlier in the day when we talked about uh, alternative production of material from uh, soap operas there. Uh, that the economics are very important and it would have been helpful I think to bring in the uh, producer side of the equation that might help us understand why some of these uh, uh, what I would consider progress like a single search all those things would be uh, wonderful and greatly improving the lives of consumers but why haven't those things taken place um, and I know one can't do everything in a talk so uh, but I Nonetheless, I think leaving us just with only one side of the coin um, diminished the, our ability to understand why these, why these areas of progress have not occurred. Um, and uh, it would be interesting too, uh, and perhaps you're already thinking of it, about ways that uh, whatever the impediments are to achieving these good things for the consumers are not taking place and what can be done to uh, remove them. I think we all understand what some of those impediments might be. So, uh, so uh, that's worth considering. Um, Kelly, I also liked your talk in particular because you used Qualtrics, which is a great way to get data. And as you suggested, you don't know with Qualtrics just who you're getting. Uh, you don't know if it's a truly random sample of the population that you're seeking. And that introduces a bit of a discontinuity with the college sample that you had. And uh, so you're not sure whether you're comparing, uh, when you talk about age, whether you're comparing people who went to your, I assume, your university with the general population who is older or just what you're comparing it to. Um, I also uh, was unclear about a couple of the things that you you brought up. So the uses and gratifications model uh, and habit as a motive. So you use habit as an independent variable, but it's not clear where that independent variable comes from. I mean, it's, it's a uh, something that happens as a result of people enjoying things, making choices within their daily lives and so forth. So it's not really um, a force per se, although it, I suppose it could be considered a force but it comes from somewhere and so that needs to be considered. Um, I was puzzled by the relationship between self-control and addiction. From the table you put up, it did not look like, um, it did, no, did not look like self-control was significant uh, from what I could see. And you would think that the more self-control somebody would have, the lower uh, they would be prone to addiction, that those things would be inversely related. And so that might be a topic worth, um, worth exploring. Um, uh, and uh, Sarah, I guess, as somebody who likes rigorous methodology, I can <laughs> only praise you for the uh, labyrinthine uh, pursuit of those multiple <laughs> conditions. Uh, and what was a couple things interesting about that is that they didn't really yield different results. But it was good that you could rule that out as a possible explanation. So that clears things up very nicely, even though it was a costly endeavor, I'm sure, both uh, in terms of sample effect size and also in terms of your sanity. Um, uh, also, I, I couldn't help but to think once again of another area of human endeavor, and that is when people are exposed for long periods of time to a short message uh, they tend to have certain views towards that situation than when they're spread out. And I think the most extreme example of that is what's been called the Stockholm Syndrome, where if you're taken prisoner by terrorists for some number of days, you begin to empathize. You have your parasocial relationship with those uh, captors. You have uh, narrative transportation from your daily life into uh, this captured situation. So. That makes me wonder whether it's not binge watching per se that you're experiencing, but rather exposure to situations and whether uh, small exposures to uh, a condensed exposure leads to some of these effects that you're witnessing rather than a media consumption effect. But uh, I'm sorry for these what might be quibbles or, or 
questions to be raised uh, because overall I'm very impressed with the uh, three papers and very happy that you uh, joined us today. And I look forward to the questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katz. And we're now going to open up the floor to questions. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, Bridget Rubin King, uh, University of Central Florida. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for an experimental investigation of binge watching. Um, I think a lot of us um, who are looking into it um, are really looking at it, what is not a lot of empirical data, let alone such a rigorous design. So that's <laughs> really awesome. Um, so my, I also struggle with this question about time um, and what exactly is a binge, right? Like, is it the all day on Sunday? Um, or is it the more like kind of sequential viewing? Um, and I, I wonder if you think that it is maybe, I mean, is it a linear additive relationship, just like the more or not? Um, and I'm also wondering about what that means for shows and fans of shows like House of Cards or Game of Thrones that are now starting three, four months later after a year of being gone and what that means um, in terms of parasocial um, relationships or kind of attitudes and affect towards the shows. Um, do I have my first piece on? Give me a second. Oh, it's on. It's doing some things. Um, so I think the, I'm going to answer your second question first, but um, I think it's a really interesting question. You know, we tested this one week later. Was there still an effect? But you're right. The way that we're consuming shows, particularly on Netflix, um, based on their distribution model, is here's a full season, now wait a year. Or here's a full season, now wait a year and a half. Um, or five months, six months, and then get back into your relationship with these characters. And during that time, um, we're, you know, there are, there are obviously fans that are talking about the characters during that time, but it's not the same continuous engagement. And actually, when we started um, looking at this, we, we wondered whether there was a parasocial interaction versus parasocial relationship thing going on, where parasocial interaction is sort of that feeling like you're interacting with the character in the moment. And we thought probably binge watching increases that, but perhaps, you know, there is this decay that happens because you're not regularly checking in with that relationship. Um, and so we weren't sure whether parasocial relationships would be increased by the binge watching process. And all we can really say now is that watching three episodes very close together seems to predict higher levels of parasocial relationships both right after and a week later. Um, and then, can you remind me what your first question was? I was really excited about it and then I forgot. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, we've had a lot of debates about that, and basically every meeting that the research team that was working on this had devolved into a well, what is binge watching? What am I doing when I'm watching like all of this? The 13 reasons why over a four-day period, but I'm never watching for more than three hours at a time. I mean, we did, we did field some survey data, again, with college students, and the consensus among the students seemed to be three or more episodes at a time. Um, that being said, we didn't ask them, well, what about for 30-minute shows? What about for hour-long shows? Is watching two movies in a row binge-watching? Is like being me in seven, at 17 and watching all the Lord of the Rings movies with no breaks binge-watching? Um, so I, th I think it's an open question, and I think, I'm hoping it's something we can talk about more. Hey, Matt Pittman. Um, so Sarah, uh, I was geeking out when you were going because I did a similar experiment, except, and I'll, I'll talk about this talk tomorrow, but I deliberately tried to avoid gauging narrative transportation, so I had to choose a show that has no continuity from one episode to the next. Um, so did you, it looked like you set it up so you just said, hey, watch these three episodes on your own time over the next um, whatever, and then they came back. Also used Qualtrics, but we didn't request. We didn't recruit a Qualtrics panel, but um, we sent them an email with a link to, um, like, a Qualtrics site that they it played the first video when they were ready, and then they could come back and play the second video, and they weren't served the survey until they had watched all three 
um, of the episodes. And then we asked them to summarize also like what had happened in the episode because we could imagine them pressing Attention play on check, their computer yeah. and walking away. Um, it's not a perfect system because you know we we we, we thought like should we bring them into the lab and make them like sit and watch in the lab? But that's so contrived. Um, so yeah, we sent them the link. We gave them three days, and we sort of like monitored if we thought they were doing it or not. It's, yeah, it's so hard to. Yeah. Um, Kelly, for you, so it looked like in your, did you, um, your finding was that for the student sample, it looked like uh, age, like as age went up, there are point. It seemed like you were saying younger people were more likely to appointment watch, which seems kind of counterintuitive. You would think, you know, youngins today are just all about like what I want now, and they don't even know what appointment TV is. Well, it wasn't that they were more likely to watch. It was just that younger people had a higher frequency of watching. So um, compared to the others that were um, appointment viewing. And so that was just something that we found for the, the college student sample for the appointment viewing. And when it came to binge watching, the same, if I remember correctly, the same thing was found. Yeah. It's still kind of, count. anyway, my final question mm -hmm. as we pass off. That seems kind of counterintuitive yeah, yeah. that young, so what's your best guess as to what's going on there? That is something that we, do, we would have to look into more and look, really look into it actually because not really something that, um, it is like you said counterintuitive to most things. They're saying that like essentially the older someone is, it's more likely for them to, or the frequency that they appointment view is higher. So it's something that we actually have to investigate more. <coughs> My impression is that, uh, excuse me, is that uh, to define binge watching in quantitative terms is always frustrating. Uh, in qualitative terms, uh, it, I, I might say it's a ritual. Uh, there's a liturgy, and and that's and that's the problem that uh, the ritual, the binge watching ritual, is pretty much a parasocial ritual, and this goes with what you were saying, but also a very personalized ritual. So uh, I'm doubtful how you can, this, uh, I, uh, uh, what you can find in, ex in an experiment in which it is not personal, but it, it's imposed from above. That's my, that's my doubt. But in general, I would say that ri uh, the ritual of binge watching is, uh, is central more than the quantity. That's you know kind of been where where we've ended up is um, is that the only way we're going to be able to define binge watching in a way that makes sense is by talking to people about how they binge watch, but that will not likely lead to any sort of like quantitatively measurable <laughs> entity. Um, I think you know we talked about having options and then having them choose which of the narratives they watched, um, but we it took us a because this is a big commitment for the participants, and so it took us a long time to recruit even enough people to have the power to do this experiment, and so it was gonna just be too much. So it's a starting point we started here, but I think you know, the more I look at the transportation literature and the parasocial literature, the more I think it's so much about self-selection. It's so much about, um, you know, my other work is on how adolescents use media as like a means of self-socialization, and like the whole th like central theme of that is I seek out media to help me figure out my identity. Um, so I, I absolutely agree with you. <laughs> um, so it's interesting. Uh, actually, we have done a similar research on look at the relationship between multitasking and also binge watching. So I'm wondering, uh, have you, uh, since you mentioned multitasking in your as your uh, one of your independent variable, but have you like you also mentioned call call viewing? So have you include call viewing as a part of like um, multitasking because you like at the same time interact with people around you? You're asking whether or not um, with the multitasking, whether we use co-viewing as well. Yeah. So no, we did not. We only looked at specifically the multitasking through um, the second use of screens or another task. So that would actually be something that would be interesting to look at because that was in the literature of um, something that is different between appointment viewing and binge watching. Okay, I have a piracy question, actually, or 
not fire resistant. <laughs> so, uh, one of the advantages that wasn't listed, which to me was a surprising gap, was not only do you need multiple subscription services, but you have to subscribe to a service. You can't buy a single show in the same way you can buy a single musical album, for example. And so, when I'm going out and I only want this one show, and I know I'm not going to watch TV for the next two months after that, there is no service for me, unless I can buy the DVDs somewhere. So I wondered if you had any thoughts on that as well. I mean, I think that that's the, the place that transactional video on demand steps in. So transactional video on demand is more when we're thinking about something like uh, iTunes or, or even on Amazon, I think you can sort of go on and purchase you know, a season of a show or episodes of a show. Now, obviously, because it's transactional video on demand and because you're effectively purchasing that show in perpetuity most of the time, the cost of that is higher. You know, it's, it's probably three months worth of Netflix subscriptions. So, yeah, I, I think that it sort of becomes a a, a more difficult economic um, decision to make as a, as a consumer. I, I mean, it is tricky. I, I think that the the way that these subscription based services are based on is the idea that there aren't many people who are only trying to consume a single show. You know, that that's, that's a fairly limited or, or niche market. Now, it may work on a, in a particular way for um, some services. So I'm thinking, for instance, the viewers of Game of Thrones who, who purchase HBO or HBO Go for the period that that season is on. So, so on, on some of the, if you like, the, the more niche services, that then becomes, I think, I think an issue for something like a Hulu or a Netflix, which is all about aggregation and bringing together larger you know, quantities of content, that is much more about offering a, an equivalent offering to what traditional television has offered. You know, the idea that you're almost doing a form of channel surfing, you know, that they are serving up the recommendations, their engines then become far more important and they're trying to get you to then engage with multiple forms of content. Of course, the distinction being that they don't get anything more whether you watch those things or not. You know, you know that, that they don't get any more fee if you watch one show or you watch 17 shows, but they want you to feel like you're getting value. So I think it is tricky for some, and that's why I earlier asked the question to, the, to, to Jay Rowe from, from HBO about whether they are thinking about HBO Go when they are starting to develop content, whether they're thinking about the sorts of content which they might develop and then offer to people in order to make a year-round HBO Go service a, a, a better or, or, or a more enticing option than simply those people who sign up to watch a single show and then cancel a subscription. So I'm not sure if that really came to exam, but, but I, I think that the answer is it's really complicated. <laughs> and thank you again to our panelists and discussant. I'm now going to turn things over to Dr. Groshek. Okay, well, um, that brings us to nearly the conclusion for the um, event for today. Um, we will depart from here, um, the castle, um, and, and uh, make our way over to the Photonics Building on the Boston University campus, which is at 8 St. Mary Street where we can um, observe and participate in the Dr. Melvin L. DeFleur Distinguished Lecture presented this year by um, Byron Reeves from Stanford University entitled Living in Media. We hope to see all of you there and there will be a reception to follow. Thanks again for your attendance, especially to all our participants, our discussants, and our chairs. It's, it's great to have you here and to see this event come together. Thanks once again.